Scott, um, we just want to reinforce that announcement. If you're looking for a way to serve here at West End and use your gifts, um, VBS is low-hanging fruit. Um, so please uh, take advantage of that opportunity. It blesses us, and we believe it's a blessing to you guys. I'm Jay Hager. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm the pastor of the Care Ministry, and uh, part, of, uh, probably the most important part of the Care Ministry is what we do in regards to prayer. We want to receive your prayer requests. We've kind of changed up over time how we receive prayer requests. Right now, the easiest way is to use that QR code on the back of your bulletin, or you can go to the website. It is such a gift to us to receive your prayer requests. Please give them. It can be the simplest of things. It can be the most profound and and troubling things. We just want to intercede for you guys. Um, We take those seriously. We keep track of them. We look at them every single week. Those do not go unnoticed. Um, And we we really uh, value um, learning more about what you are going through in life. So please do that. We would love to receive dozens of those each week. Um, With that said... Please turn with me now to um, Philippians chapter 3, verses um, 10 through 21, as we pick up right where we left off last week in this series on Philippians. As John has told us repeatedly, this could be called the book of joy, Paul's love letter to the Philippian church. As I was beginning to prep for this, I was thinking of this church as these kind of like baby Christians, but that's not really at all who they are. They're, they're a church plant. They're 10 years. Uh, Paul planted this church um, in AD 52. He writes this letter in AD 62. And so uh, the, these people have been through a lot. If you've ever done church planting, which I have, you kind of age exponentially on the front lines of ministry. And so these are seasoned vets in a sense. Um, But Paul is bringing them back to the fundamentals of their faith as uh, that joy that they are, have done such an amazing job of preserving is being threatened by outside forces like it always is for the church. I thought a lot of our church um, in the season that we're we're in, we're in this really beautiful season. And I think we can all feel that. It feels really optimistic. Um, This church has had different seasons, ups and downs. And right now, um, we're kind of in this moment of, of joy and delight over all the things that are going on here, the way the Lord's growing this church, John's new leadership. It's just really uh, sweet and beautiful. And so I think we would do well to pay attention to Paul's really encouraging um, teachings here about what we are to do, the simple things we should continue to do so that we don't grow complacent. Satan wants us to drift into apathy. Um, to rest on our laurels, if you will, and we need to stay sharp in the hands of God. Um, And there's really simple and beautiful ways we can continue to do that as a church that he wants this church to do as well. I mean, he has so many gushing things to say about them, right? While he's, you know, chained in prison, he's saying that he holds them in his heart. He yearns for them with affection. He remains alive. (laughs) He literally chooses life for their good. Uh, Paul's completely committed to helping these sweet, um, although they are seasoned veterans, they are childlike in their faith. That's what's preserving that joy that they've experienced in Christ. So this morning, let's continue to look at Paul's really parental, kind of protective, godly, loving wisdom that he shares with these faithful people that they might preserve and stand firm in this sacred and precious joy that they have in Christ, and so that we would as well. So please stand with me now for the reading of God's Word. Paul writes, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward towards what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. 
Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. Their glory is their shame. With minds set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that as we study it together this morning, we would know Jesus and the power of his resurrection more. Becoming like him as we receive your joy that you offer us through your beloved son, the word made flesh. Speak to us now. Convict us, challenge us, encourage us for your glory and our good. I want to invite you all now, please take a moment and pray for your own heart. Pray for the heart of your neighbor. Please pray for me. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, this past Thursday, uh, my son Henry, he's five years old, finished his first season in the Creve Hall, the famous Creve Hall Baseball League that we had heard all about. And I was very curious about signing him up for this. It's coach pitch at age five. I think I played t-ball until I was eight. So I was really interested to see how all of this would work. And to get Henry ready, I started, I think, a couple months maybe before teaching him how to hit a baseball. He had never really done that. We bought a bat, the whole deal. Um, it was especially important for me because in my own athletic experience, I was, I was born with crossed eyes. I don't know if you knew that about me. At age three, I had two surgeries. I was born with strabismus, lazy eye, two surgeries. First surgery didn't work. My eyes went that way instead of straight, which is a whole other story. And then the second surgery, it worked. My eyes have been kind of the same. You can still tell a little bit in some pictures if you look closely enough. But the doctor told my dad, my dad had been a baseball player and athlete. He's like, listen, if your son's going to play sports, I'd probably keep him away from the hand-eye coordination sports, which doesn't leave a whole lot left. His depth perception is always going to be a little bit off. Well, of course, I live in a house where, where we, we had this park as our backyard and there's a baseball field, and that's where all the boys went to establish their athletic identity. Um, and I wasn't going to miss out. Um, so I went down there and I tried to play baseball, and I was not very good. Um, I could throw and I could catch. Hitting was always tough. I could do just well enough to make the team. Um, but it, it, there's, there's a kind of a sore spot in my heart in my own story about um, my struggles with baseball. So I was like, I'm going to get Henry ready. So we worked on it and we started with the fundamentals. And I learned this from Jimmy Dykes. I teach my daughter, Essie, who plays basketball, that you make layups. Jim, Jimmy Dykes is an ESPN uh, commentator, college basketball. He says you make layups with your eyes. And I always thought that was kind of interesting. And the same with baseball. You hit a ball with your eyes first. You, you, have to, you, can't, see what you, you can't hit what you can't see, right? And then we worked on his grip, how to hold the bat and throw his hands at the ball. So he looks at the ball, and then he throws his hands at the ball. And Henry, you know, my son, um, he is a, he's a wild child. And uh, this, this was this really precious, sacred moment where he would pay attention, and he would receive my instruction, and he would listen, and he would implement it, and he was great at it. And uh, he, he had a wonderful season, got better as the season went on. He may have hit over 400 and gone 23 for 43, but that would be weird for a dad to keep his son's uh, batting average. Um, so I'm just, that's what I thought he did, because it seemed like he did really well. It may be a note on my phone. Um, so uh, why do I tell you that? Well, Paul's, he's coaching these Christians on how to live the Christian life well, how to continue to progress and he's doing it, again, these seasoned kind of veterans who've been through a lot, he's, he's reminding them of the simple things that God calls them to. He talks about their grip and their gaze here, their grip on grace, their gaze at glory. Two simple points, two things we would do well to remember in our own place of savoring the joy that we are sharing right now as a church. First, the grip that we have on grace and how to maintain it. Verse 10 through 16. I want to connect here. You know, this is, a, this is the start of a new section in chapter 3. We're picking, in chapter 3, we're picking up on last week's sermon in that passage. And so the connection, the flow here between verse 10 and 11 to 12, Paul says this in 10. 
that I may know Jesus and the power of his resurrection, that I may share in his sufferings. You know, it's easy to read past that. You know, Paul's like the super apostle, a great Christian. He's like, oh yeah, Paul would, all, of course Paul would say that. But it's, it's pretty remarkable that he's, he's encouraging these believers to take the same mindset, to, to want to share in Christ's sufferings. When's the last time you prayed that? Um, and it's because Paul knows something. He knows this side of heaven in this broken, sinful world, suffering is the currency that God uses to make his grace rich in us. It's just the way it is. But the beauty of it is that in Christ, we don't have to fear it. He's taking the fear of it away. He knows that all of the enemies in the outside world, Satan especially, wants to snuff out that joy and delight, right? He wants to make them miserable. He wants to discourage them and disillusion them. Times haven't changed much. And so he's saying, keep your grip on grace as you suffer. You see, this is telling us something really important about suffering, that it's this currency, this, in, this incredibly rich currency that we have as Christians that we can spend on these invaluable things called wisdom and discernment and grace. We have the opportunity to purchase the strength and the joy and the empathy because we have an, we have an account that we'll never, we can never spend all of it. It's infinite. And through suffering, we become richer and richer in Jesus so that we can obtain these things that he, he gives to us as these wonderful gifts. What they've obtained through it is joy. Paul's joy is inexpressible. He says he rejoices in his sufferings. It's an incredible reality. Just as we don't grow fit by the osmosis of standing in a gym as much as I wish I could, we don't grow to maturity, as Paul talks about here, or spiritual fitness without the activity of shared suffering. I've done CrossFit in the past. I think CrossFit, the church could learn a lot about how CrossFit does community. For some strange reason, people love getting together and throwing heavy weight around and groaning and screaming and sweating together. <laughs> of all the things, that, that shared suffering, it breeds this like really special community where people want to come every day and, and work out. Because in it, they're exercising those physical muscles and that shared suffering we have in this life, no matter what we're experiencing, is exercising that muscle of faith. Paul knows this value. He knows what it's giving and making him, and so he no longer fears it, because in it, he gets to do what he says here, to know Jesus in his resurrection power. That's the key for these believers to understand as they walk their journey in the face of these Judaizers, the dogs, and the evildoers. It's with that great hope that Paul encourages them, press on. Keep moving forward in this life. Understand that suffering isn't, isn't keeping you from the finish line. It's actually propelling you forward. Many of us come into this room, we're tired we're worn out. We're delusioned. Life is hard. If only you understood, we say. This is meant to encourage and strengthen us in the fight. Paul longs for this resurrection from the dead when he will be made perfect and his suffering will end. But until then, he doesn't lose heart because it's doing something wonderful to him as he lives in complete and utter dependence upon Jesus. It's what we all long for, right? If you're in Christ, that's your deepest desire. You, that desire to make Jesus your everything. It's what we're all striving for and against. The world seeks to distract and distort and sabotage. Our very own hearts do that. The struggle's real. Paul knows it. He struggles. We struggle. Here's the key. Look at verse 12. Paul presses on. He can only encourage us in this he uses this race metaphor to keep going, to keep striving, to keep reaching, to grasp, to lay hold of that which is precious. But he says, you can only do that insofar as you have been laid hold of first. This is what John agrees with, right? We love because he first loved us. It's that same Christian concept, right? This is only true in Christ. In other words, we can strain and grasp and reach for all the good things in life, sobriety, 
selflessness, sacrifice, service, because we have been laid hold of. Jesus has got us. I don't know if anybody in here has ever been repelling. I worked at Young Life Camp one summer and had to learn to repel, which, you know, like your first time, it's pretty terrifying because they tell you, like, you're not going to do it until you lean back and you're standing with your feet on the edge of a cliff that just goes straight down. And it's like, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to your primitive brain. Just lean back and the harness will hold you. And when the harness is holding you, then you can begin to jump down a mountain, which is remarkable, right? It's thrilling. Jesus is saying, I'm the harness. I got you. You got to lean back. What are the places in your life where you can lean back and let him hold you? That requires courage, requires faith. But you're invited into that. Not to do it on your own, but to lean into what he has, the strength he has for you. As you lean back, you become weak. <laughs> and you lean into the strength that is Jesus. And you get, to, you get to do some amazing things. When you study running, you learn, obviously, pretty simple, <laughs> um, fundamental, is keep your head straight and your arms moving and your hands moving straight. You don't run like this, right? That's not the proper way to run. It slows you down. So you keep looking forward to be efficient to get to the finish line quicker. You don't run looking side to side. I don't know if any of y'all saw the finish to the 150th Kentucky Derby, being a Kentuckian myself. It's a, I love that race. Um, we had our neighbors over and watched it together. And there were three horses. And they say it's, I guess, the closest finish maybe ever. It was literally decided by a nose. So if you looked on the side, there was a nose that just stuck out an inch and then won the race. As exciting as that was to witness, our race is actually entirely different. <laughs> Ours is not being decided by a nose. The victory is not in the balance. We don't strain to try and win the race. The race is won. We press on to lay hold of the victory that is ours in Christ. He's won the race for us, so we might be free to run ours with confidence in the outcome. In him, our progress towards the finish line, it's guaranteed. Even though the outcome is never in doubt, we're still given the privilege to run the race, to traverse the course, to jump down the mountain with all its challenges and all its goodness. To press on, to lay hold, it's active, right? It's not passive. We're not growing in our faith passively. That osmosis thing, just by standing around. There is something to do. We're not just saved from something, we're saved to do something because of the work of Jesus. That's why Paul tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because the progress is assured. So, so good time to ask yourself this interrogative question. Are you seeing progress in your life? In what ways? If you live in the grip of grace, holding on to him as he holds on to you, then you will become more like him. Are you? What would your neighbor say? What would your spouse say? I found that to be especially convicting this week. I sometimes think people long to emulate me more for my love for CrossFit, cold plunging, and keto than they do for my love of Christ. Paul says in chapter 1, to live is Christ, to die is gain. We press on no matter the pain or the loss or the sadness we've had to endure because of what we have to offer, a dying and decaying world. We have a beautiful resurrection power. Paul talks about it as we are jars of clay, right? We're the, fashioned by the potter. We're these delicate, beautiful things that have this incredible treasure in them, and it's a treasure that transforms the world as we share it. The invitation for us is to do as Paul has done and surrender our past mistakes and failures, not being defined by them. Paul says, I strain forward, I, I look at what's ahead, not what's behind. Now think about the person who's saying that. Joe Novison uh, drew, drew my attention to this this week. I never thought about it, but in these churches that Paul's planting, I mean, Paul was murdering Christians, a lot of them, before he became a Christian and started playing these churches, there's probably people in these churches that are widows and orphans because of Paul. And he's saying, I don't look at what's behind me. It's, it's, he's not saying, you just forget about it, it doesn't matter. He's saying, I'm not being defined by it. Even the most awful things that I've done, they don't disqualify me. 
No matter what you bring into this room, you are not disqualified from this race. He says, press on, the prize that is Jesus and his power he offers us still awaits. He says, that's godly wisdom. That's what mature believers think like. Then he says, he talks about their gaze at glory and where they're looking, not only what they're holding on to, but what they do with their eyes. He says, brothers, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. The point Paul's making is that we must see what the teaching of the gospel looks like in each other's lives. We need each other. We need to be committed to this not only for our own sake, but for the sake of others, for the sake of the community that we're called to live in. We know this reality as parents. Our children watch us. They watch what we grip on to, what we hold on to, what we lay hold of, and what we look at. They see where our eyes go, and they want to grip onto the same things and look at the same things. Our faith is not meant to be lived in isolation, but in community. We're called to help each other grow in grace, to have mentors, to have people we look to. Paul's offering himself as that here. Paul brings up who we should look to and follow, and then in verse 18 and 19, who we should not look to. He brings back up those threats to joy, the evildoers. And I just want to highlight Paul's heart for them. It's really remarkable to me that he says this here that he's... He's considering these evildoers and what they're distorting, the damage that they can do, the dogs, the, those who, whose belly is their God, their appetites, you know, they, they're led by their impulses and what they feel and what they desire rather than what God wants for them. They have their mind set on earthly things. They even glory in their shame. They start calling things that are evil good. And Paul doesn't have this like malicious hatred for them. He says he is in tears as he writes about them. That's the kind of heart God calls us to have. Paul says even in Romans at one point, he would give up his salvation for his Jewish brothers and sisters to know this Jesus and his gospel. And that's who he's talking about here, these Judaizers, his his Jewish brothers and sisters. He says it brings him to tears to think about what they're missing out on and then the damage that they are causing. It grieves Paul in his soul. I think he longs for us to grieve in the same way with hearts of love, heart of the Father. While Paul has a heart for the lost, he knows the negative influence they can be on the church as they create the culture surrounding the church and they press in on them. That's what the culture is doing to us. It presses in on us. It's always been doing that. Is your belly your God? Does your appetite lead the way? It's so easy to do that. Or are you led by something greater? Jesus. Paul says in Romans, we exchange the truth for a lie. It leads to spiritual disintegration. That's what Satan wants. The disintegration of our minds and hearts. Devotion to self-indulgence that distorts our desires. It leads us down the path of pride instead of humility. It leads us into places of isolation and self-reliance and withdrawal. And the way to counteract that, the only way to counteract that, to live a life of self-sacrificial service and love to others is through Jesus who did the same for us. There's no other way. Paul's warning them about the drift towards complacency when things are going well. We guard our hearts with our eyes, right? To avoid the drift towards complacency. The eye is the window to the soul. We live the Christian life. Just like we hit a baseball with our eyes, we make a layup with our eyes, we live the Christian life in large part with our eyes. Jesus says the eye is the window to the soul. He cares a lot about that. The eye is a lamp into the body, he says in Matthew 6. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body is going to be healthy, full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of dark. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? More than you could comprehend. You need a supernatural light, supernatural love to vanquish the darkness. He says, this is what you lay hold of. This is the resurrection power. This is the glory you're headed for. Gaze on that. John said something interesting in our department head meeting this past week. He said, it took 400 years to get Israel out of Egypt. 
And it took 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. That's why they wandered. They needed to get Egypt out of Israel. And it was a process, right? There were moments where they said, I, can we just go back to slavery? That seems a little bit better. When we choose our sin, that's what we're saying. I like slavery better. That's just asinine. When he's promised us this journey, even with all its trials and travails, to be leading to someplace glorious and good, keep your gaze on that. And it's so simple, right? It's not, this isn't some complicated recipe for the Christian life. It's lay hold of Jesus, he's laid hold of you, and look at him. I mean, when Israel needed to be healed in the wilderness, what, they just erected a staff with a snake on it and said, look at it. And they were better. Jesus is raised up on the cross. God is saying, just look at him. Look at him, trust him. Believe in him. It's the beauty of the Christian faith. Just receive it. The writer of Ecclesiastes would agree. He would say, live your life in light of the end. John and I were talking recently about how often do you think of death? And I was like, I kind of think about it every day. I think that sounds morbid, but I think it's kind of helpful. <laughs> like this could be it. Life is fragile. Our trying tragedies and circumstances will make that very apparent to us. I'll leave you with this story. In 1952, uh, this lady named Florence Chadwick, she was trying to become the first woman to swim from the Catalina Islands to mainland California. It was 26 miles. The weather was foggy the day she tried to do it. It was cold, but she decided to go through with it. Um, there's boats next to her making sure she, you know, stays alive. And she swam for 15 hours and until she begged to be taken out of the water her mother was in one of the boats, and her mother's trying to champion her. Keep going. Don't give up. You're almost there. But exhausted, Florence taps out, and she gets out of the water. And it wasn't until she was on the boat that she discovered she was less than half a mile away. In her news conference, she said this, All I could see was the fog. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. A lot of us are living in a fog. But we can see the shore. That's why we have this. We can get glimpses of glory through our Heavenly Father. If our appetite is our belly and we're calling what is shameful good, setting our sights on earthly things, then we should be afraid because you're living in a fog. Making your belly your God, you're linking your happiness to what you consume. But conversely, for those who aren't, and you think you're doing well, you can easily link your holiness to what you refuse to consume. That's what the Judaizers were doing. Either way, you're headed in the wrong direction, swimming in the fog. Paul would say that if you've positioned yourself as an enemy, if you're doing this, you position yourself as an enemy of the cross. How? Because the cross has no functional purpose for you or influence over your life. If that's you this morning, it doesn't have to be this way. Jesus invites you to turn from your sin back to his glory and his grace. His mercies are new for you every morning. He stands ready to lay hold of you. I used to say that God is a God of second chances. That sounds right. Scotty has shown me through his ministry that that's not exactly correct. You see, Scotty reminded me, and I think he's reminded us, he's not a God of second chances, but of the second Adam. A God who has left nothing to chance, but all things to Jesus. He doesn't give us second chances. He gives us Jesus, who is everything we need and more than we can imagine. Amen? Holding on to that truth, let's, let's pray now as we prepare our hearts for a time of confession. Father, we thank you that you have left nothing to chance. And in your good providence, you have chosen to lay hold of us as your beloved children, secure in your grip of grace, inviting us in to grip you back, giving eyes to gaze upon your glory and the glory that awaits us when you return and vanquish evil forever, cementing your victory that is ours through our champion, Jesus Christ, and all that he's accomplished for us. Lead us now into a time of reflection and repentance so we might loosen our grip on the sin that only distorts and destroys our lives. Help us to rest in Jesus, to lay hold of our Savior, and the joy we have in him through our shared confession. It's in Jesus' merciful name we pray. Amen.